Chapter 9 The House Azure Our destination was one of those accretive structures seen in the older parts of the city, but so far as I know, only there, in which the accumulation and interconnection of what were originally separate buildings produce a confusion of jutting wings and architectural styles, with peaks and turrets where the first builders had intended nothing more than rooftops. The snow had fallen more heavily here, or perhaps had only been falling while we rode. It surrounded the high portico with shapeless mounds of white softened and blurred the outlines of the entrance, made pillows of the window ledges, and masking and robing the wooden caryatids who supported the roof seemed to promise silence, safety, and secrecy. There were dim yellow lights in the lower windows. The upper stories were dark. In spite of the drifted snow, someone within must have heard our feet outside. The door, large and old and no longer in the best condition, swung back before Roach could knock. We entered and found ourselves in a narrow little room like a jewel box in which the walls and ceiling were covered with blue satin quilting. The person who had admitted us wore thick-soled shoes and a yellow robe. His short white hair was smoothed back from a wide but rounded brow above a beardless and unlined face. As I passed him in the doorway, I discovered that I was looking into his eyes as I might have looked into a window. Those eyes could truly have been of glass, so unveined and polished they seemed, like a sky of summer drought. "'You are in good fortune,' he said, and handed us each a goblet. "'There is no one here but yourselves,' Roach answered. "'I'm sure the girls are lonesome.' "'They are.' "'You smile. I see you do not believe me. "'But it is so. "'They complain when too many attend their court, "'but they are sad, too, when no one comes. "'Each will try to fascinate you tonight. "'You'll see.' They'll want to boast when you are gone that you chose them. Besides, you are both handsome young men. He paused, and though he did not stare, seemed to look at Roach more closely. You have been here previously, have you not? I remember your red hair and high color. Far to the south in the narrow lands, the savages paint a fire spirit much like you. And your friend has the face of an exultant. That is what my young women like best of all. I see why you brought him here. His voice might have been a man's tenor or a woman's contralto. Another door opened. It had a stained glass insert showing the temptation. We went into a room that seemed, no doubt in part because of the constriction of the one we had just left, more spacious than the building could well contain. The high ceiling was festooned with what appeared to be white silk, giving it the air of a pavilion. Two walls were lined with colonnades. These were false, the pretended columns being only half-round pilasters pressed against their blue-painted surfaces, and the architrave no more than a moulding. But so long as we remained near the centre, the effect was impressive, and nearly perfect. At the farther end of this chamber, opposite the windows, was a high-backed chair like a throne. Our host seated himself in it, and almost at once I heard a chime somewhere in the interior of the house. In two lesser chairs, Roach and I waited in silence while its clear echoes died. There was no sound from outside, yet I could sense the falling snow. My wine promised to hold the cold at bay, and in a few swallows I saw the bottom of the cup. It was as though I were awaiting the beginning of some ceremony in the ruined chapel, but at once less real and more serious. The Chatelaine Barbea, our host announced. A tall woman entered. So poised was she, and so beautifully and daringly dressed, that it was several moments before I realized she could be no more than seventeen. Her face was oval and perfect, with limpid eyes, a small straight nose, and a tiny mouth painted to appear smaller still. Her hair was so near to burnished gold that it might have been a wig of golden wires. She posed herself a step or two before us, and slowly began to revolve, striking a hundred graceful attitudes. At the time I had never seen a professional dancer— even now I do not believe I have seen one so beautiful as she. I cannot convey what I felt then, watching her in that strange room. All the beauties of the court are here for you, our host said. Here in a house azure, by night flown here from the walls of gold to find their dissipation in your pleasure. Half hypnotized as I was, I thought this fantastic assertion had been put forward seriously. I said, surely that's not true. You came for pleasure, did you not? If a dream adds to your enjoyment, why dispute it? All this time the girl with the golden hair continued her slow, unaccompanied dance. Moment 
flowed into moment. Do you like her? Our host asked. Do you choose her? I was about to say, to shout rather, feeling everything in me that had ever yearned for a woman yearning then, that I did. Before I could catch my breath, Roach said, Let's see some of the others. The girl ended her dance at once, made an obeisance, and left the room. You may have more than one, you know, separately or together. We have some very large beds. The door opened again. The Chatelaine Gracia. Though this girl seemed quite different, there was much about her that reminded me of the Chatelaine Barbea who had come before her. Her hair was as white as the flakes that floated past the windows, making her youthful face seem younger still and her dark complexion darker. She had, or seemed to have, larger breasts and more generous hips. Yet I felt it was almost possible that it was the same woman after all, that she had changed clothing, changed wigs, dusked her face with cosmetics in the few seconds between the other's exit and her entrance. It was absurd, yet there was an element of truth in it, as in so many absurdities. There was something in the eyes of both women, in the expression of their mouths, their carriage, and the fluidity of their gestures that was one. It recalled something I had seen elsewhere, I could not remember where, and yet it was new, and I felt somehow that the other thing, that which I had known earlier, was to be preferred. That will do for me, Roach said. Now we must find something for my friend here. The dark girl, who had not danced as the other had, but had only stood, smiling very slightly, curtsying and turning in the center of the room, now permitted her smile to widen a trifle, went to Roach, seated herself on the arm of his chair, and began whispering to him. As the door opened a third time, our host said, The Chatelaine Thicla. It seemed really she, just as I had remembered her. How she had escaped, I could not guess. In the end, it was reason rather than observation that told me I was mistaken. What differences I could have detected with the two standing side by side, I cannot say, though certainly this woman was somewhat shorter. It is she you wish, then, our host said. I could not recall speaking. Roach stepped forward with a leather burse, announcing that he would pay for both of us. I watched the coins as he drew them out, waiting to see the gleam of the chrysos. It was not there. There were only a few Asini. The Chatelaine Thicla touched my hand. The scent she wore was stronger than the faint perfume of the real Thicla. Still, it was the same scent, making me think of a rose burning. Come, she said. I followed her. There was a corridor, dimly lit and not clean, then a narrow stair. I asked how many of the court were here, and she paused, looking down at me obliquely. Something there was in her face that might have been vanity satisfied, love, or that more obscure emotion we feel when what had been a contest becomes a performance. Tonight very few, because of the snow. I came in a sleigh with Gracia. I nodded. I thought I knew well enough that she had come only from one of the mean lanes about the house in which we were that night, and most likely on foot, with a shawl over her hair and the cold striking through old shoes. Yet what she said I found more meaningful than reality. I could sense the sweating destriers leaping through the falling snow faster than any machine, the whistling wind, the young, beautiful, jaded women bundled inside in sable and lynx, dark against red velvet cushions. Aren't you coming? She had already reached the top of the stair, nearly out of sight. Someone spoke to her, calling her my dearest sister, and when I had gone up a few steps more, I saw it was a woman very like the one who had been with Vodalus, she of the heart-shaped face and black hood. This woman paid no heed to me, and as soon as I gave her room to do so, hurried down the stair. You see now what you might have had if you'd only waited for one more to come out. A smile I had learned to know elsewhere lurked at one corner of my Paphian's mouth. I would have chosen you still. Now that is truly amusing. Come on, come with me. You don't want to stand in this drafty hall forever. You kept a perfectly straight face, but your eyes rolled like a calf's. She's pretty, isn't she? The woman who looked like Thekla opened a door, and we were in a tiny bedroom with an immense bed. A cold thurible hung from the ceiling by a silver gilt chain. A lampstand supporting a pink-tinted light stood in one corner. There was a tiny dressing table with a mirror, a narrow wardrobe, and hardly room enough for us to move. Would you like to undress me? I nodded and reached for her. Then I warn you, you must be careful of my clothes. 
She's turned away from me. This fastens at the back. Begin at the top, at the back of my neck. If you get excited and tear something, he'll make you pay for it. Don't say you haven't been told. My fingers found a tiny catch and loosed it. I would think, Chatelaine Thiekler, that you would have plenty of clothes. I do. But do you think I want to return to the house absolute in a torn gown? We must have others here. A few. But I can't keep much in this place. Someone takes things when I'm gone. The stuff between my fingers, which had looked so bright and rich in the colonnaded blue room below, was thin and cheap. No satins, I suppose, I said as I unfastened the next catch. No sables and no diamonds. Of course not. I took a step away from her. It brought my back almost to the door. There was nothing of Thikla about her. All that had been a chance resemblance, some gestures, a similarity in dress. I was standing in a small, cold room, looking at the neck and bare shoulders of some poor young woman, whose parents perhaps accepted their share of Roach's meager silver gratefully, and pretended not to know where their daughter went at night. You are not the Chatelaine Thikla, I said. What am I doing here with you? There was surely more in my voice than I had intended. She turned to face me, the thin cloth of her gown sliding away from her breasts. I saw fear flicker across her face as though directed by a mirror. She must have been in the situation before, and it must have turned out badly for her. I am Thikla, she said, if you want me to be. I raised my hand, and she added quickly, There are people here to protect me. All I have to do is scream. You may hit me once, but you won't hit me twice. No, I told her. Yes, there are. Three men. There is no one. This whole floor is empty and cold. Don't you think I've noticed how quiet it is? Roach and his girl stayed below and perhaps got a better room there because he paid. The woman we saw at the top of the stair was leaving and wanted to speak to you first. Look. I took her by the waist and lifted her into the air. Scream! No one will come. She was silent. I dropped her on the bed and after a moment sat down beside her. You are angry because I'm not Thikla. But I would have been Thikla for you. I will be still. She slipped the strange coat from my shoulders and let it fall. You're very strong. No, I'm not. I knew that some of the boys who were afraid of me were already stronger than I. Very strong. Aren't you strong enough to master reality, even for a little while? What do you mean? Weak people believe what is forced on them. Strong people, what they wish to believe, forcing that to be real. What is the autark but a man who believes himself autark and makes others believe by the strength of it? You are not the Chatelaine Thikla, I told her. But don't you see, neither is she. The Chatelaine Thikla, whom I doubt you've ever laid eyes on. No, I see I'm wrong. Have you been to the house absolute? Her hands, small and warm, were on my own right hand, pressing. I shook my head. Sometimes clients say they have. I always find pleasure in hearing them. Have they been? Really? She shrugged. I was saying that the Chatelaine Thikla is not the Chatelaine Thikla. Not the Chatelaine Thikla of your mind, which is the only Chatelaine Thikla you care about. Neither am I. What then is the difference between us? None, I suppose. While I was undressing, I said, Nevertheless, we all seek to discover what is real. Why is it? Perhaps we are drawn to the Thea Center. That's what the Hierophants say. That only that is true. She kissed my thighs, knowing she had won. Are you really ready to find it? You must be clothed in favor, remember. Otherwise you will be given over to the torturers. You wouldn't like that. No. I said, and took her head between...